But here, you know, we're seeing that texture that is a bullish factor in the reaction with mar uh, market participants, institutional market participants increasing their presence. And then the price is trying to commit below a very significant support that was defined by the selling climax uh, in 2016, and yet it cannot do so. And the price quickly reverses back. So this is an element of what we are gonna call a spring in the methodology where the, there is a temporary commitment down or attempt to commit down and then almost immediate recovery. All right, how's it going, Roman? Welcome back to the SimCast. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, glad to have you. So uh, first episode with you, we discussed uh, a lot of your background, uh, credentials, education history, um, the time that you spent with Hank at um, Golden Gate. Uh, so yeah, just if you if those of you who are just watching this part two with Roman, be sure to check out the um, the links that we'll have below to uh, see this, the first episode with Ramon and uh, a great, great chat and a lot of wisdom in there. Some of, some of Ramon's early struggles with trading that we all face as we're going through um, uh, through the, the path to consistency. So be sure to check that out. All right, so uh, getting started on part two here, I think what we're gonna do is really introduce you to the Wyckoff methodology. So. Roman uh, teaches this on a regular basis at wyckoffanalytics.com. So what we're going to do today is just kind of walk through that, talk through um, really kind of the basics, the tenets of the Wyckoff methodology, and then a great introduction on that. And then talk about some of Roman's trades where he's used this methodology. Um, so really excited to see that. Did you have a good week, Roman? Yeah, it was okay. I mean, busy as always, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. Awesome. That's fantastic. Cool. Well, let's get started. Who was Wyckoff? Tell us who Wyckoff was. Um, I know he was part of kind of like the titans of uh, technical analysis way back in the day, but I probably don't know a whole lot about him, as, as, or at least not as much about him as you do. So tell us about who was Wyckoff. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how Wyckoff in comparison to, let's say, Elliot or Gann or the Dow is a lesser known name, although he is mentioned uh, in our technical analysis community as kind of like the five big grandfathers of technical analysis. Um, and it was just a beautiful age for technical analysis uh, in, you know, in the early 900s, 1900s, um, where the Dow was creating his theory, the Elliott was uh, formulating and codifying you know, the Elliott wave uh, principles. Um, uh, you know, Gain, Gain was kind of like a very mystic trader and, you know, uh, he was also, he was the know, one with like the wheel, wasn't it? The Gain wheel or there is plenty of tools that you know, and... Gain introduced, um, you know, some of them are still very much usable. I mean, like I, I personally, uh, studied Gain and I failed. So, and it's my fault. It's not the fault of Gain or, you know, I don't want to put anything. What did you not, what, what didn't resonate with you about it? Was it, you know, it just did not have the same structural approach that I would want. Um, so my okay. early studies were all concentration on Wyckoff and Elliott wave. Um, so that was my preference. And I think that I was just drawn to uh, like the price structural analysis. It just both methodologies would give you or were, were given me at the point of my studies some kind of references as to how the trends are going to unfold, how the trading ranges are going to unfold, in which sequence the structure and so on and so forth. And it made a lot of logical sense. Um, and I just didn't have that with other methodologies. Although, you know, the Dow theory is actually, you know, I would say like a very, very you know, foundational uh, methodology as well. And if somebody is into technical analysis, you have to know that for sure. Really? I would say out of all four, Dow is probably the one I know the least um, about. And we are forgetting about uh, Edwards and McGee, obviously, you know, also, you know, this last okay. kind of like fifth name. So those Got are it. the five big titans of technical analysis and, you know, conventional technical analysis patents, um, if applied correctly, I think it's extremely valuable, useful, impactful for your trading. And again, you know, like 
for students that just kind of like want to dive in into technical analysis, I always recommend to go and study all five to study mm-hmm. also, you know, modern grandfathers of technical analysis, somebody like John Murphy, somebody like Martin Prine, uh, Charles Kirkpatrick. I mean, you got to read uh, those books, uh, especially if you're at the beginner, um, and study what are the kind of like the newer ideas that came in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and now we are using them and modifying those as well um, as we go. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe to our channel and be sure to like our videos. Also, check out tradingsim.com forward slash blog for more content. But, you know, you have to start with the basics. um, And I would say like the foundational basics are all of those five. McGee, Dow, uh, Wyckoff, Elliott, Ging, uh, you know, to a certain degree, I I would probably skip Gang. and they all kind of lived in the same era, mm-hmm. I believe, like early 1900s, which, yeah. again, I'm not as well read um, as you are. But one of my favorite books was, it was, well, there are two of them mm-hmm. because they kind of interlap as far as like the the historicism there. It's, it's, okay. and, and that was Jesse Livermore's, well, I guess it was uh, Lefebvre, uh, his book on Jesse Livermore, and then The yeah. Panic of 1907. Mm-hmm. And how they how they all kind of you know intertwine there like there was there was so much going on you had like the creation of the Fed thereafter yeah. Um, yeah. and so it was really just like this golden age of of trading and it seemed like Wyckoff uh, maybe Elliot Dow all these guys were kind of you know living through this this age and yeah. trying to put their own stamp on on either like the education. Um, uh, or on history there. How did Wyckoff differentiate himself? Like, I know he had like publications and things like that at that time, but he was also, you know, he, he interacted with guys like Livermore in uh, some of those yeah. popular guys back then, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He had a lot of connections with the street um, and he was on the street. I mean, like he was, uh, he started his career as a boy and he was, uh, you know, uh, running for brokerages companies, um, you know, and, you know, doing, uh, you know, some of the charting for them and so on and so forth. Then later on, he, has, uh, you know, uh, went into deep studies about the markets and he started uh, seeing some of the principles behind the stock market operations uh, when he would talk to people like Jesse Livermore. So, uh, mm-hmm. They were, um, you know, colleagues or maybe even friends uh, where, you know, Jesse would uh, be interviewed by Wyckoff multiple times. And then Wyckoff would go also to other stock operators of of the time or, you know, commodity operators of the time um, and uh, get their knowledge as to how do they uh, conduct the campaigns. How do they at that time... um, and it could be even that Jesse Livermore was invited, you know, to conduct the campaign by um, an owner of the company. An owner of the company would come and would just say, like, I need to distribute like a million shares um, at the much higher price. Can you do that for me for a specific commission? So, so Jesse, mar- would, would you say he was the market maker at that point? Uh, he would be a composite operator uh, in okay. terms of how he would observe a meaningful supply of stock, which is not really possible in our uh, uh, day, you know, like to have that many uh, shares of stock uh, in one stock, in one company. And then obviously before that, he would assess the market conditions. You cannot do those type of campaigns uh, if the market is really weak. Um, So you have to time it correctly and you have to understand, you know, the company, whether you could mark up the prices, you know, Mm -hmm. to the higher level and then distribute it there. And there were a lot of uh, kind of like tricks about campaigning um, a significant amount of supply of shares. And um, that's what Wyckoff saw. And that's what he codified in his um, writings, whether it was the magazine of Wall Street, uh, of Wall Street uh, uh, where he was um, editor. And that magazine of Wall Street um, was in existence until, I believe, like mid-70s. 
wow. 1970s. Um, unfortunately, you know, Wyckoff's biggest mistake uh, was his divorce from his second wife, I believe, uh, where she took everything and she took that oh. magazine of Wall Street <laughs> and the heroes closed it all out, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that was his worst trait. Uh, possible. I, I mean, like was, she cleaned him up. She cleaned. That him was up. Livermore's problem too, wasn't it? Um, Livermore also had, you know, his own problems, right yeah. there. You know, and uh, such an ext- uh, eccentric man yeah. uh, with multiple attempts of the suicide, and you know, the last one, you know, cool. uh, was successful. So, composite operator. Uh, there mm-hmm. might be a few people who are listening who don't know what the composite operator is. Why don't we Why don't we talk a little bit about that and then kind of jump into the Wyckoff methodology? I'll, sure. I'll get some screen share going here and um, get some visuals going. Yeah, um, I would say that you know, composite operator, or the composite man, um, is a is not a technical uh, definition of a market participant per se. Um, that was a heuristic that was created by Wyckoff himself. And, um, you know, the more I read Wyckoff uh, himself, like his original writings and books, the more I realized that he didn't really mean just one person, you know, like the stock operator, like Jesse Livermore. What he really meant is all of the market participants that are participating on the correct side of the price cycle. So, It's the collection of uh, institutional traders, if I would bring this uh, heuristic into the modern world, it's the collection of institutional traders that as a herd create a significant amount of uh, leverage uh, uh, and um, uh, amount of money that is being put in in one position. And that absorbs the available supply and with supply uh, shrinking, then the prices are starting to go up, establishing an uptrend. And then other institutions are jumping on that trend and you know, uh, retail people are jumping on the trade uh, on that uh, trend as well. And that's what creates the trend itself. Let's say if we're talking about the uptrend and sustainability of that trend. And then at some point where you know, by modal definition of those institutions, there is some kind of overvalued situation, um, uh, you know, long-term overvalued basically, uh, because they are looking at the big price cycles. That's when they will start uh, their uh, distributional behaviors. Um, And this is what we're just basically trying to capture. I mean, like if you would be asking me like, what's the main purpose for us to study in Wyckoff Method is to understand the motives of institutions with a lot of money, with a lot of research, with a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, experiences uh, where the majority of their trading is going to be on the correct side of the price cycle. So we are studying their footprints. And, uh, and as we look at the chart, we want to understand where institutions are most active Mm-hmm. And what does it mean for the uh, current price structure? Um, so are they, are the, the composite man, then, if I'm correct, is it's kind of like who we refer to when we talk about they. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like when you're yeah. thinking about they, like what are they doing? What's it, it's so it's a little bit of everything. It's like you said, it's like those who have the biggest footprint in the market, whether it's the market maker, whether it's um, you know, hedge funds, uh, people of, of a high net worth, that sort of thing. Like it's, it's all encompassing. Um, and Wyckoff called it the composite man, basically. Yeah. He was even talking about uh, analysts as being a part of the composite man heuristic. He was talking about, um, you know, our modern version of like TV analysts or bloggers. Those would be people like if they are influencing the drive, uh, the price drive, uh, you know, advances and declines, they are part uh, of of the whole price cycle, you know, development. Um, So it's a little bit much deeper, um, you know, definition of the composite man. Uh, I think on the very uh, kind of like, you know, basic level, we just could say that the composite man or the composite operator is smart money with a lot of liquidity and they are driving the the price cycle. Got it. Got it. And I like what you put here in your description that he dedicated himself to instructing the public about the real rules of the game 
and how to play with the smart money guys. So he was, was he kind of a champion for, for retailers For retailers? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, um, again, uh, I think that you have to study, if you're serious about technical analysis, you have to study the, uh, Dow theory, you have to study Elliot, you have to study Wyckoff. Absolutely. Um, uh, Wyckoff, in my opinion, was very greedy. He was very greedy. He wanted, you know, uh, the method to encompass, uh, many facets uh, of trading mm-hmm. and analysis of the markets. Um, so he has a structural analysis. He has the tape trading. He has, um, you know, a comparative analysis where he compares, you know, stocks to the market, you know, groups to the, to the market, groups to the stocks and so on and so forth. And then he has uh, tactical decision-making as to how you would trade that. Um, and obviously, I'm kind of always simplifying this and going right, you know, to the main points of the methodology. Um, but, uh, you know, that's why he was greedy, because he didn't really want it to give you like one setup or one filter and so on and so forth. He wanted um, the public to understand um, the answer to the question of why, why things are happening exactly this way in the market. Um, and this is a very common question that we get from students. There are two most common questions that we get from students. One is why things are happening the way that they are happening because people mm-hmm. want to know. And then the second question is what's next? What's going to be next? What's going to come next? That uh, was the price. Got it. Got it. Well, why don't we, why don't we just kind of springboard into that and, and kind of dive into um how this Wyckoff methodology provides a solid foundation for basically, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost any, any time frame you want to trade off of, yes. whether you want to trade equities, mm-hmm. futures, commodity, yeah. you know, you name it. Like, how mm-hmm. does this, and I've kind of stopped right here on the five-step approach to the market, but you, you talk whatever you want to talk about, about how Wyckoff really sets the stage for just about anything that's um, that you want to trade in the market and that you can also scale with? Yeah, it's a very common question. Can I use Wyckoff method uh, for different timeframes? Yes, you could go even to the tick level and apply it there. You could you know, uh, use it uh, on the intraday timeframe. You could use it on the yearly timeframe, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily. It doesn't mm-hmm. really matter. Um, and then you could use it for different uh, asset classes. You could use it for stocks, cryptos, futures, um, anything that has a uh, primary data behind it. Uh, and what do I mean by primary data? Price, volume, time, and sentiment that we could uh, get from the price action. Um, so if you have you know, those uh, primary data points, then you mm-hmm. could apply Wyckoff methodology. Awesome. Well, do you want to um, maybe take a look at some of the, I know you have some, um, like a price cycle here. I, I, this is mm-hmm. probably somewhat familiar to most of our viewers, but did Wyckoff actually come up with this? Did he, was he the first to kind of observe you know, this I, and popularize I, it? I wouldn't be uh saying that he was the first one who uh came up with this because uh there were obviously there was an understanding and awareness of the price cycle before Wyckoff. so i think that a lot of uh the work that he has done uh was codification of some of the main principles behind the marketplace but um i think it's very important to uh to focus on how it's being explained rather than who has created it first. So, and I think that Wyckoff explanation of the price cycle um, goes into that answer of uh, why things are happening the way that they are happening in the marketplace. So here uh, on the display is the Wyckoff price cycle. So where he just basically says that there are areas of where the uh, stocks, um, the shares of stocks will be under heavy accumulation by the composite man, by smart money, by institutional money. And as we go through that accumulation period, uh, which could be horizontal, which could be vertical in nature, 
um, we should be able to recognize the footsteps of that accumulation of that institutional accumulation. And as the institutions accumulate shares, can technical conditions in the markets improve? And you could capture that from your technical analysis tools and get on board of the emerging trend, let's say an uptrend. And as we are emerging into the new uptrend, more people that recognize that the conditions are changing are gonna be jumping on that trend and that will push the price up and that will sustain the trend for some time. We're gonna go into the markup phase or an uptrend. And then we're gonna go through different stages of an uptrend, which will be uh, concluded by some kind of either exhaustion by bias or more speculative phase where we can't, you know, not um, necessarily strong institutional hands will be excited about the price uh, advances with a lot of momentum and they will be jumping on board and the smart money, the composite men will be distributing their uh, supply of, uh, of shares into that excitement. And as they distribute, the conditions start to change again. And our goal at White Coffins is to capture that change in our analysis using the charts and using the primary data. That's basically what we do. We just mm -hmm. basically a small fish that is looking at the big fish and trying to capture the right with the big fish because the big fish uh, creates all of those big market waves. Got it. So I, I was kind of toggling back and forth there as you were talking. And the, and the, the cool thing I think about Wyckoff is that you've got this larger framework of your typical price cycle, right? Which you just uh, described really well. Um, but it's, it's kind of like learning what happens in these phases, right? In these little yes. accumulation phases. And that's kind of what I was, I was showing earlier. Do you want to talk about maybe if, 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 if the viewers are unfamiliar with this, it's it, he gives us kind of a, a nice pattern or framework to basically uh, analyze what's happening in here and to determine whether or not this is accumulation yeah. Or, yeah. or whether this is distribution. Yeah, this is a good uh, kind of bridge for us to look at the uh, uh, schematics here. So the main idea behind an accumulation area is, uh, well, first of all, is this an accumulation or is this a continuation of the distributional behavior. Um, that's number one. So we need to concern ourselves with the question of what is the bias in the consolidation? Um, the second question is the studies of those consolidations, because not only the bias needs to be defined, but you need to understand when the price is ready to leave the trading range. Therefore, the timing for the mm -hmm. price to um, start emerging into, let's say, an uptrend. And then the third one, um, which kind of was on the surface in the methodology, but I overemphasize it to our students, is the character of the next potential move. Are you going to have the uptrend that's going to be outperforming the market in general, that is going to be outperforming a specific group that stock belongs to, or maybe a specific, you know, uh, Futures like is gold going to outperform silver? Those studies are extremely important for us for the optimization of the uh, of our return. So on the screen right now, there is a schematic that I've created for the stock charts. Um, this is um, the schematic of the consolidation that is divided into phases. So uh, the Wyckoff structural analysis um, uh, divides consolidation into certain periods where behaviors are different. So for instance, when we look at phase A and you see those you know, uh, abbreviations, uh, they are acronyms, yeah? So for instance, uh, P, S, C, uh, S, C, A, R, S, T. So those are just acronyms for, for the specific market behavior. So for instance, selling climax, which is a very standard and conventional concept for all of the technical analysis traders. You should know this. Um, this is the stopping of the previous behavior, which was a downtrend. And then automatic rally as the change of behavior. This is the first rally that is outperforming any of the rallies in the downtrend. And we could see the presence of the institutional demand there, expansion of the momentum, signature, and so on and so forth. And then a secondary test, ST. This is just a local test of the climactic action that preceded it. 
um, and uh, kind of like a, a proof of evidence that the supply now is incapable of moving the prices further down in the downtrend. So there is a logic behind each phase development in the consolidation. And the logic behind it um, is based on the interaction of between the buyers and sellers, between uh, uh, demand and supply. And from there, the price structure is being created just based on those interactions. And as we go through the whole consolidation, each phase defines specific behavior. Um, and as we go through the trading ranges, we want to, uh, first of all, understand the codification uh, of that timing of that phase analysis, what needs to happen in each phase. And that gives us an understanding. Are we still in the trading range? Are we far away from the emergence of the new trend? And then obviously some of the phases are gonna be more telling, like phase D is gonna be an emergence uh, of the new uptrend in the accumulation. So therefore um, this gives us a time and opportunity to start entering our positions, whether we are scaling in into the position or just going with the full size and expectations of how the uptrend could unfold or how an early uptrend could fail. That's great. And, and you know, I'm kind of thinking about what's happening behind the scenes here with that composite man. And, you know, as you talk about that, like that selling climax, for example, you know, if, if you use this as, as kind of just a, a general rule of thumb, um, and it's what's amazing to me is how this schematic, if I overlay this on my charts just about every day, I see it happening every single day. You With know, I variations. see that, that, that climactic action. Yeah. I see mm -hmm. it stopping. I, you know, you see the retest and it's, you know, testing the supply levels in there. And, and you know, just like you said, it's, it's so cool how it actually works. Well, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about what schematic is and, you know, how could you use this? Because um, especially lately, it was uh, happening with the kind of like this mini distribution that we had in Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. And suddenly the whole crypto community figured out that Wyckoff method exists and that it, it has those schematics. And uh, ironically, you know, they were using the schematic for the distribution, you know, uh, from stock charts, if you go down a little bit. Yeah. Um, you'll see that. Um, and um, they, they were kind of uh, like uh, surprised how well it worked. So they, if you remember the structure of the Bitcoin uh, mini distribution in, uh, you know, in, uh, in 2021 from May, um, you would say like the price action that precedes that you know, is being shown here in the schematic. I mean, this is- that? Should we see if we um, should find that? Sure, go ahead. Let's um, see. This is both uh, a coincidence and not a coincidence. Um, I mean, obviously, when we uh, you know talk about specific price structure, let's say for the Bitcoin, and we talk about how the price of the leading asset is going to be distributed, we we're going to have a specific price structure. Um, showing the behavior of people going through this event. Um, so schematics are not necessarily a one-to-one -one representation of what should happen or what will happen. Uh, schematics are more guidelines as to uh, the behaviors that we should observe during, let's say, distributional top or during the uh, accumulational bottom. Um, and schematics will have variations on that. So I want all people always to know that Schematics will work really nicely in one case, and then you have some kind of uh, weird extreme um, interpretation or variation on how the price unfolds, and then it's gonna be completely different. So um, you just have to be a little bit careful uh, with the schematics and use them more for the purposes um, of you know, having a guideline rather than you know, this is how it's gonna happen. But in this case, it worked nicely um you know with the distributional top and i wouldn't even say that the whole thing was a distributional top i mean like i still argue uh, that the distribution in the uh this mini distribution that we had in bitcoin started not in february but actually mid of april uh yeah and more into the upthrust of the distribution and on the way down 
Um, there is just too much to talk about this probably in this podcast, but you know, mm-hmm. like that middle of April uh, drop, um, if you could highlight that, yeah, right there. Um, so it has this uh, sign of weakness mm-hmm. that produces the new lower low relative to the previous low. And then the rally has uh, at first really good momentum, but then stalls. And our signal to the downside was um, right on that bar. Yeah, uh, on that down bar um, that you were just. This one here. Uh, no, before that, before that. Right. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Got it. So right on this bar, our bias has changed for the whole trading range. Um, and we saw that the failure of the rally and then a more localized failure on that particular bar after the change of behavior, which was the reaction in the middle of April, suggested that we're going to have a move to the downside. So that was our call. Prior to that, I would say that you know, we still were in the reaccumulation pattern until the change of behavior happened, until that failure of the rally happened, until that localized change of behavior on that bar happened. And it was actually a very interesting call because as the price started to drop, then the next call was into the climactic action or rather before climactic action, yet that, that last bar to the downside. Yeah. Um, that was actually a very interesting call because I was calling for one day drop uh, of more than 10,000. And uh, that was kind of like a very, very interesting and extremely accurate call because it happened exactly that way. It's a but, pretty bold call. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was probably one of the best calls that I've done you know, uh, uh, this year. Um, but um, you have to ask a question of why that call was made. It was made on the understanding of where we are in the price cycle and where we are in the structure. Um, So we are in the downtrend. We are probably coming into some kind of stopping action, which will be climactic. This is the action where weak hands are gonna be capitulating in masses. Uh, uh, And therefore the price will drop with more momentum, with more velocity. And then the strong hands will see some kind of value around 30,000 and they will come in and will start absorbing as value investors, as contrarians, you know, all of the supply from weak hands. So therefore mm-hmm. the day should be expanding and spread and should have the volume signature that's gonna be the largest volume signature, the biggest volume signature, you know, throughout the chart, you know, to the left. Um, so in a way that was a simple call, but it kind of looks nice because it's just so dramatic as yeah. a price action. Well, I think what's really neat here is that you, you've you got two great examples of these schematics. Um, you've got the, the distribution event here, mm-hmm. which we just showed you. I mean, if you can see me toggling back and forth, mm-hmm. like, I mean, just it's almost picture perfect. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't like you drew the schematic anytime after Bitcoin did that, you know. That was, that was done, if I believe correctly, in 2013, 2014. Two, yeah. And then, you know, if I scroll back up, I'm sure I can find, you know, something like this accumulation yeah. here, That's which looks, exactly. yeah. looks very mm-hmm. similar to what you see. Yeah. So uh, our down. call here for the accumulation for the reversal was exactly the reversal bar at the end of that weak reaction in mid of July. Hmm. Um, and we said that this was an attempt to spring, if you could point to that particular bar. Um, was the first bar to the upside after the second uh, the second reaction? Yeah, here. Uh, no, to or here. more to the right. Oh, yeah. July. Sorry, yeah. I was in June. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So the spring in June uh, comes and has complex structure. Um, again, I'm going a little bit into more details of, of mm-hmm. what we probably need to go here in the podcast, but you know, it suggested that supply was still you know somewhat present in the bullish. Uh, accumulation. So that suggests the complexity of the retest. And mm-hmm. we had that on the next reaction, but look at the spread on the next reaction. It's just diminishing, um, especially the spread to the downside, and it cannot create uh, a lower low anymore. Mm. So that first reversal bar to the upside was our call. Um, and it was actually a, a position that I initiated in my own account. And I was you know, uh, tweeting it out that this is the position. I still have it. 
Um, and uh, it was just a great, great um, kind of like cycle for us with all of the calls. Um, whether those were distribution or accumulation calls. Now, this is something that uh, David Weiss um, liked to talk a lot about is uh, he, he really loved these springs, right? Mm -hmm. Said you could make, yeah. uh, what was it? He said you could make a living trading springs and upthrusts, right? Upthrust, yeah. But, Which is, uh -huh. go ahead. Yeah, just, you, just basically along the edges of the trading range. Yes, yes. Having said this, and I've talked to David, and we've become really great friends in the last year of his life, and um, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, his passing was um, really tough. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, for me personally, just because I was just so involved with him in his, in his last year, um, uh, it was kind of like on par uh, with Hank's passing as well. Uh, I mean, just two great men, two great white coffins. Uh, you know, going away, you know, almost at kind of like in the same, at the same time, Hank passed away in 2017. Um, and um, coming back to his phrase, which he coined, you can make a living trading sprints and up thrust. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yes. But you got to understand which up thrust and sprints to take. Exactly. Because there are sprints and up thrusts in both uptrends and downtrends. Mm -hmm. um, at the in the distributional and accumulation of patterns, and uh, a lot of them will fail. So you have to understand which ones to actually take. Uh, but it's such a true statement. Cool. Yeah, and you know that's something that I was just thinking about um, with the Wyckoff method is that it creates so many different ways to. Um, to trade, you know, for example, if you want to be a short-term trader and, and like David, you, yeah. you, you have a way of figuring out which one of those springs are going to work. You know, you've got a nice move here between, uh, you know, say, you know, 31,000 and 39,000 or, you know, whatever it is, you know, if you've, if you've back tested that strategy, there's a lot of different ways to do this uh, and to use this method to just kind of open your eyes to a lot of different ways you can trade. Yes, I, and, and I think this is what I kind of alluded uh, at the top of our uh, session, that the methodology gives you an understanding of two things. Why things are happening the way that they happen because of the institutional presence, and then how does the price structure is going to unfold? Mm -hmm. So any type of trader on any time frame has to understand what the current market environment is. Are we in the long-term uptrend or are we in the consolidation? Mm -hmm. um, a, and then go to their time frame, uh, uh, decreasing the time frame. You know, uh, if let's say an intraday trader, they always have to start somewhere on a higher time frame to understand the environment, and then go to the lower time frame and see: Are we for today in line with that higher time frame, or are we counter to that? And then your setups and your trading is going to be based on that understanding. Um, so for instance, if you are in line with the trend, then you know you could be more aggressive with your risk. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you could uh, be perceiving that today might be a trending day and therefore the duration of your tra trades will extend. Uh, also your targets will be uh, extended as well. If we are in the counter uh, trend day, and I'm just talking about the intraday traders here, um, then uh, on the opposite, your duration of trades um, for the trades is going to be uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. And then also your counter trades targets are going to be much, much uh, uh, closer. Uh, and you're not going to be overextending those. Um, and your size also will matter. So your yeah. size on the counter trend trade are going to be significantly lower. Um, so Wyckoff method gives you that framework, uh, the reference as to how, as a trader, you need to behave in any type of environment. And that goes to any time frame. I mean, like I was bringing an example of for the intraday trader, but swing traders will do the same. They will assess a much longer term kind of like campaign type of structure. And then they will say that uh, on this particular swing with this particular reversal, this is the most probabilistic and you know uh, most desirable uh, point of entry for the most optimal result. 
Um, and that's that's what the swing trader would do. And obviously the long-term trader would just look at the whole structure and then assess the causality of the whole structure, potential outperformance, sustainability of the, let's say, in the uptrend, um, and then you know make some kind of portfolio decisions as to, okay, I'm going to select this group to participate in. Within this group, I'm going to select these stocks because they have leadership characteristics and potential outperformance in the future. And my strategy, my tactics you know, for implementing this is going to be this, this, and this under the specific market conditions. Awesome. Well, why don't we segue into that? Um, you, you said you had some trades to share, right? Yeah, yeah let's do I that. I think that would be fantastic. Why don't I stop my share and um, see if you've got the ability to share. I would love yeah. to see that. I'd love, because I what I'd really love to, for the viewers to uh, witness is just how you kind of step through these and some of your actual mm -hmm. trades. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I would like to show you guys two trades. Um, so they were not necessarily uh, discussed with John before I sent them uh, uh, to John. So I wanted to pick something, first of all, in different time frames. So I'm going to show you a long term campaign trade. And then I'm going to show you something on the intraday level, just to show that the method works or doesn't work, or uh, on uh, either time frame. And secondly, I wanted to show you um, a winning trade and a losing trade. Um, I don't want people to have an impression after you know our interview here that uh, this is the holy grail. And this is something that you need to take and just uh, say, like, it's going to work uh, every time. Uh, no, there is a lot of um, moments where you're going to fail um, and your analysis is going to fail or your execution is going to fail or your understanding of what's going on is going to fail or the market conditions might change. What has been shown, let's say, some kind of uh, promising accumulational uh, uh, characteristics, behaviors might turn into something else because of new news coming in, specifically maybe for the company or the market in general is changing the, the directionality and you're just being caught up into the, in, in that. So you have to understand why, you know, those failures happen and for what reason um, and, you know, to do your post analysis. Um, with this specific trade, uh, this is a buy of Marion Pharmaceutical. So this trade was, um, you know, a hedge fund trade uh, where a lot of long-term campaigns are being conducted. And uh, this came right after the COVID low. So you see the extension of the trading range. And in Wyckoff methodology, we would be talking about uh, the extension of the trading range is the extension of the causality or the cause. Um, so this suggests that there were quite a lot of accumulational activities at the beginning of the trading range. And sometimes it does take multi years for the stock just to be consolidating, to be picked up uh, eventually by institutions throughout the whole trading range. But the majority of more active buying has happened in 2019 since May uh, to 2020. You could see this from the volume signature. It's increasing. So the market uh, participants are increasing their involvement in the stock. What comes next is the question, once we see that um, participation has increased, is what is the result of uh, all of this presence by the institutions? And somebody might be asking, well, what about retail uh, traders? Well, retail traders cannot create this type of high volume signature. So we see that it's the institutions that are present here more actively. And what is the result? We try to commit to the downside uh, on the reaction that, you know, uh, the texture which looks more bullish rather than bearish. Uh, this looks more bearish where the volatility is increasing and we are in the downtrend. This looks more bullish. Even though the price goes down, the spread, the downward spread, is diminishing. So this you know, tells us. I want to, if I can lost. interrupt you there, Roman. That was that was kind of like the aha moment when I was taking your classes. Is how can a downtrend look bullish? 
Yes. Sounds like an oxymoron, right? Yes. Yes. And, and that's why it's so counterintuitive. And it takes time to first acquire this belief that this is a possibility, that the reaction could be bullish, and then to acquire the skill to see that. And then acquire the skill to execute on this. But here, you know, we're seeing that texture that is a bullish texture in the reaction with more, uh, market participants, institutional market participants increasing their presence. And then the price is trying to commit below a very significant support that was defined by the selling climax uh, in 2016. And yet it cannot do so. And the price quickly reverses back. So this is an element of what we are going to call a spring in the methodology, where the, there is a temporary commitment down or attempt to commit down, and then almost immediate recovery. And then uh, COVID-19 creates another low, which is very interesting, because on the increased selling, we are producing a higher low. Uh, mm -hmm. As you remember, COVID low for the market was a lower low, a significant lower low, more than 30% decline. Here, the price of this stock did not even go below the spring. Did not relative go strength, below. maybe. Yeah. So it's a that Wyckoff would describe that as the comparative outperformance. We in the modern world would be saying that on a relative basis, this is a much stronger stock. So this becomes the second requirement for us to select this type of stock. The first one is obviously just the trading range and Wyckoff structure itself. So here we are with those two selective uh, uh, requirements being satisfied, and we are entering position right here uh, before the resistance. Our assumption that the trend is going to take us above the resistance, and then it's going to consolidate in some kind of loss test at the much higher level. Please note how many tests we have here uh, at the level of, of the support. As the price goes up, now we are testing at the upper level. So this was the trade that was originated right about this area right here. And this is a weekly chart. So let's see what has happened with this trade. Here we go. So I'm showing here all of our points of entry. And this is now the daily chart. So we are entering after the gap with an assumption that there is enough momentum here for the price to actually push higher. And so far, everything is going so well, right? So we're adding more, adding more, adding more, adding more. So this is a fully sized position. And this is just the technique that um, you know I've been using in my own trading, but mostly for the long-term campaigns. I want to see a confirmation of the uptrend, um, not just emergence, but sustainability. Um, and behind that, there is a lot of like price movement, momentum characteristics, any type of you know reactions that are you know bullish in nature. And this is where you scale in more and more and more. But look at what happens next. Stock news, and then we gap down. So this was one of the gaps uh, against the position that I caught um, in 2020. Hmm. There were actually, now, on average, you would have maybe like two or maybe three of those per year where you caught up in the opposite side um, of, the, uh, of the price action and, and the price would gap down on some kind of announcements, earnings against you significantly. So you have to, in your trading plan, you have to have those contingencies, uh, black swan contingencies, I call them. Um, and uh, you could have like a 10, 20, 30% drop and you need to backtest that against your whole portfolio to understand how you can uh, weather this out. Um, so this was uh, a, an interesting trade where it was a losing trade, but the conditions for this trade were favorable. And I just want people to know, and I'm starting with this trade, uh, I, I want people to understand that you're going to fail. Hmm. And you have to be okay with this. Because you cannot predict the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Even if the conditions are all by the rules and the market is favorable and you're looking at the stock and everything is favorable in the structure, sometimes those failures will happen. 
And that's the name of the game. You have to be okay with this. If you're not okay with this, stop trading, do something else. Give your money to a money manager and go and do something else. Yeah. If you're not suited up for this type of market behaviors, stop. Don't lose your money. Um, and you don't have to be like a lot of people withdraw and they become a little bit bitter. You know, like, oh, the market always seeks my stop losses and it hits me. The composite man always knows where my stop losses uh, are. Such a nonsense, absolute nonsense. If your stop loss is being hit and the price continues in the direction of your analysis, this means that your stop placement was incorrect. My second question to students when they uh, tell me like, oh, my stop was hit because the composite men, the institutions, they saw my order, mm -hmm. uh, stop loss order. I always ask them, what was the size of your position? And usually the answer is like, oh, I had 100 shares. I had a 1,000 shares. Okay, so do you think that a big institutional trader with billions of dollars would be concerned about that type of size of yours? Probably not. Probably not. So we give ourselves too much meaning into why things happen the way that they happen. And it's much easier explanation to blame somebody else for your mistakes rather than yeah. just go and to analyze and just say like, I was wrong. I was wrong in my stop loss placement. After the price started to move, maybe I was more aggressive with the stop loss movement. And maybe I prematurely exited because I was afraid or something. So, so yeah, there, there, there is so much to that that you have to explore as a trader on your own rather than you know, uh, try and blame the market or a composite man of somebody else. Fair enough. And what I'm what I'm curious about here, if I could ask you a few questions, is was this more of a long term campaign that you were thinking about here? Um, yeah, absolutely. So long term campaign meaning that beyond a year horizon. Okay. You know, it's more kind of like a business cycle type of campaign. This is not a swing trade here. Got it. Uh, so, for instance, one of the positions that we've picked up in the hedge fund at the same time you know, in the uh, like mid April uh, of 2020 it was a great time to come in and to start establishing on confirmations, a lot of positions. So for instance, NVIDIA, uh, we established in mid April of 2020, and that's a long-term campaign. We're still in that position. We are trading around this, you know, selling in the overbought conditions, buying more in the oversold conditions uh, that it, uh, that is related to the uptrend that we are currently in. But mm -hmm. that position is still in, you know, with over a year and extremely profitable. So the idea for this trade here was kind of the same long-term campaign. And but speaking to risk management, then you um, how do you typically manage that around pharmaceutical companies or, or bio, you know, biopharmaceutical companies right. that are you know, maybe awaiting um, a little bit of news or something like that, or, or maybe the move in itself hinges upon the successful um, completion of an FDA yeah. phase three or something like that. Is it, Do you position yourself a little bit smaller or are you just, it's, you just kind of treat it like earnings or something like that? Like it's just yeah, part of the so game. This is a very specific question. Um, because this is a very specific group of stocks that you have to think about in a slightly different way. Um, so uh, with pharmaceutical stocks, we kind of made it a, a rule to have less of an exposure, less risk, just because of those potential gaps that mm -hmm. are possible, um, you know, on any news-driven catalyst events. And then um, you, you want to manage them, uh, obviously, a little bit, uh, you know, tighter. Uh, with your risk. Uh, but the predominant idea is just you know, to have a little bit less of an exposure. Um, you know, in this case, um, we probably were a little bit more overconfident um, in, in our position. And that's just what happened. You know, like mm -hmm. the worst thing has happened. Having said this, it did not derail our performance for 2020 at all. And actually, we had multiple stocks like this. And 2020 was kind of like a much 
better year for positions where that would go like this against you. Why? Because there was so much volatility in the market. So if the investors saw that if somebody was some stock was going up significantly, they would jump on that and they would drop something that does not work really fast. Um, so there were more gaps like this uh, in 2020 than in other years that I've seen. And it's just well, a numbers game, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, you know, outlasting the ones and managing your risk well enough to know that it's a probabilities game. So you're going to have these gaps down, like you, you just said, but as long as you're, you're um, continuing forward with, um, you know, the, the winners that you have in the market, then it's all, it's all going to come out in the wash. Well, we are literally like projecting uh, into the next year that we're going to have two or three of those. Like yeah. we basically say like, it was the full size position. If this event happens, like 10, 20, 30% drop, what would be on a single position, the effect on the portfolio? And then you kind of put it in as the projection for the whole year that mm -hmm. you're going to lose this many basis points just based on that and then did you just hope that they either don't happen or don't happen you know that dramatically um but they do happen and you have to plan for this um and that's why i, I keep saying like the market is uncertain you know you operate in the um in the environment of uncertainty you can't predict you could just follow the market uh, or follow institutional um uh, uh, money managers as they make huge bets in the marketplace. And your goal is just to identify uh, the directionality of those huge bets. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, because, you know, it, it's one thing for uh, to bring somebody on and just share a bunch of winning trades, but that's something that we all need to hear, like is, is risk management, the acceptance of loss, it's all part of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, this is another trade. So this is a winning trade, and this is just a different time frame. Uh, this is uh, an intraday time frame. This is the whole session uh, on one minute, or almost the whole session on one minute. Um, you know, usually the question here: Do you trade on one minute? No, uh, I trade off the structure that I see on one minute, uh, but this is not my time frame. I mean, for me, what's important, whether I'm looking at the one minute, three minute, five minute, daily, weekly, yearly, is to see the structure. And the structure for this particular day was that, was the initial uh, rally and kind of like the change of behavior, we are going into a trading range. And this trading range has characteristics of the accumulation. Uh, we're seeing higher lows, higher highs. Uh, we're seeing more bullish uh, behavior on the rallies, uh, then on the reactions. The last attempt to create, you know, a, a volatile event and the commitment below the support uh, has a lot of uh, effort increase behind it. So there is uh, kind of like this uh, big effort increase behind uh, uh, behind the traders who think that the market is going to go down from here, and yet the instit institutional traders are coming in and they're starting buying at this point. And that creates a higher low. So that's like a principle of effort versus result, increased effort, diminished result. And that signifies the buying by institutional uh, traders. And from here, we see, start seeing confirmation in the testing and then the reversal right here. So on this confirmation, this was the entry right here. Um, and I remember this, I was in meetings, but I was trading and just kind of like getting into this trade, um, did not do any add-ons, but this was a possibility on the way up. Uh, I was just too busy, you know, to kind of like be in this trade completely. And then um, what I was seeing at that time, and I was remembering how I was explaining this to students, look at the momentum characteristics of this rally against the momentum on this rally and against momentum on this rally. What could we say about the momentum? It decreases and then decreases more significantly. So that just tells us that demand or the buying um, uh, capacity is diminishing and we could potentially see some kind of change of behavior. So I'm catching the first uh, bar where the change of behavior uh, is starting to happen. 
This is where supply is starting to in, uh, come in and that increases the result to the downside. So I was just too busy to like, you know, figure out the last uh, particular bar, uh, which would be the top bar. The price went up a little bit and then it started going into the trading range. So I'd say that this was a pretty close to the top. Um, you know, I just needed to, to capture that change of behavior in initial uh, signs of it. And I thought that was a good trade. So this is an example of a different time frame, different asset and different outcome. And that's where you sold uh, or where, where did you sell there? Yeah, right here. Right in there. So this is the actual trade right here. Got it. So I'm curious there, are you, are you still thinking in terms of like a, a certain number of waves up in the back of your mind as you, as you trade these, or are you simply now just kind of like analyzing the momentum? Like you said, like these intraday swings, it's getting, you know, a little bit, the thrust up is getting shorter and shorter and shorter while perhaps mm -hmm. uh, going back to your effort versus result, you can kind of see some spikes there down low. I don't know if those are corresponding with, with the highs or if those are actually igniting the move, but is it more or less just, um, just, just to analyzing the tape through the chart or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think you could, uh, I like that uh, analyzing the tape through the chart. So the tape is basically, uh, it, 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 the tape is different from the chart. Uh, the tape is just basically, you know, uh, quotes, bids and ask uh, with a certain size, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, my always argument with tape readers is that the chart reflects the tape and mm -hmm. you read the tape through the chart. Uh, but I mean, like for the purists, because, you know, everybody wants to be a, you know, a pure tape reader. Uh, and so on and so forth. For me, that doesn't really matter as long as you're making money and you could explain uh, what, what you're doing. Um, but you just basically read the chart, you read the price action, you read the volume action, um, you think about the time elements of that, you think about the uh, sentiment, you think about uh, you know, the causalities, the targets and so on and so forth. So it's not just a very simplistic momentum, uh, moment, uh, look at the momentum, but more kind of like a comprehensive, cohesive um, uh, run at the analysis and understanding like what is going on here, where the changes uh, are happening and how are they gonna be shown on the chart? And then the next question is what's gonna be your behavior at that moment? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna uh, scale out? Are you gonna close the position um, or are you gonna still continue holding it? That's awesome. And do you trade with anything else like moving averages or is just um, just the candles and the volume? Well, there is a moving average on this chart. The question is where, right? Right. <laughs> I caught you there. Yeah, you put uh, me on the spot bit. again. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of my career, I was using a lot of technical indicators. Um, now I'm using just primary data. So price, volume, time, sentiment. Um, because once you've been doing this for a while, like, like myself, like, you know, for 20, 25 years, um, you're going to see a moving average without moving average being on the chart. Yeah. I mean, you could really see, like, depending on what size of the moving average you want to use, right? So... Uh, uh, probably something like this. Here's your moving average. So mm -hmm. those were good buying and uh, add-ons opportunities. This was the break uh, of some kind of moving average. And you're just visualizing a technical analysis tool. And at some point, you just don't even need it. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the momentum here based on price action rather than using some kind of indicator. Um, but indicators um, are not bad things. They just need to be used in the with the correct understanding of what are you looking at? What are you right. looking for? You know, and then um, this second biggest mistake with indicators is just like using a multiple number of indicators for the same concept, let's say of the momentum. So somebody could be using like RSI and MACD. I mean, like, they basically um, are showing you almost the same type of momentum signature if you can't translate this. And it doesn't really matter the environment. 
you can use those type of momentum indicators even in the uptrend and downtrend in environment and, and still be extremely effective. Um, it's just all kind of, uh, you know, the way of uh, where you are with your skill, you know, how experienced you are and so on and so forth. So to me, I'm seeing RSI here. I'm seeing stochastics here on this chart. I'm seeing moving averages on this chart. Um, I'm seeing any other type of indicators or you know, any type of signals from other methodologies. Uh, it's just at some point, you don't have to have this on the chart. Fair enough. Yeah, and that's interesting. And, and, and it's also interesting to see that you're doing that on an intraday basis. Like this is a day trade of, of the NASDAQ, right? Now the E-mini yes. futures. Yeah, e-mini yeah. futures, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's that's really neat, man. I, I mean, like, and that's exactly what um, I was hoping we could kind of get into today is just is seeing how you actually visualize the tape through the chart because that to me, you know, like like you were talking about, uh, like we were just discussing earlier, like it was just a, it blew my mind that you could call, call a downtrend bullish, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's all part of that. Like, like reading the tape and seeing that, hey, this is temporary. Like there's, there's something happening here, whether it's, you know, the lack of, of, of downward result and, and the mm -hmm. effort that's coming in, uh, you know, whatever it is, that whole concept there is, is really unique. I think to the way that you teach, um, chart reading, tape reading, was there another trade that you had or was no, that's it. But that's I it? mean, cool. Yeah. Um, I yeah. didn't think that we needed more. I just wanted to show, um, no, that's perfect. Yeah, I wanted to show different timeframes, different outcomes, different kind of like, you know, um, intentions for the trade. Um, and uh, hopefully that was useful. No, I think that was that was fantastic. That was absolutely great. So, well, listen, why don't we leave it at that then? And um, and I know we've got a part three coming up. So I'd like to kind of, um, you know, just kind of segue into the I guess the path to mastery that you have kind of outlined in the curriculum and how you use your, your teaching style to, um, to do basically like Wyckoff did, you know, be a champion for the retail trader as an educator. And maybe we can do that next week. Absolutely. That sounds like a great topic. And uh, um, I think maybe this is the most important topic. I mean, uh, when people come to trading, they heavily are concentrating on acquiring the knowledge um, on how to conduct the analysis. Um, and majority of people are not necessarily moving forward beyond that. And then when you talk to more seasoned traders, you know, if you've been around for five, 10, 15, 20 years, and so on and so forth, then you have discussions. Well, how do you progress from knowledge into a correct execution? So what kind of skills do you need to develop as a trader, as an analyst, you know, to transition from just knowledge to actually making money? Mm -hmm. And then once you accomplish that and you feel like, okay, well, here and there I could produce, but then there is still some kind of inconsistency. Then you start talking about the process and the mindset. Uh, and those are like two uh, big rabbit holes where you could spend a lot of time. Yeah, that's the truth. Well, I look forward to that. Sounds great. Looking great. Well, have a great weekend, too. Roman. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. And happy trading to all. All right.